Uh, so welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, we are talking today about auditing your website for usability issues. Um, who am I? I'm the voice out of the ether. I'm Laura Quinn. I am the executive director of Idealware. Um, Idealware, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, is a uh, nonprofit organization. We're a 501c3 ourselves. And our mission is to provide information to help nonprofits make smart technology decisions. Um, so everything from uh, what uh, content management system should we use to what accounting system should we use to how do I think about social media to our topic for today, thinking about website best practices and usability. Um, so what does that actually mean? What are we going to cover? Um, so we're going to just think at a high level as to what it might mean that your site is usable. Um, and then we're going to uh, dive down into particular details for usability, uh, like, for instance, home page navigation, uh, content, form design. And then we'll come around to the end to talk about ways you can actually verify whether it is or is not usable. Um, user tests, interviews, web surveys, web analytics. Um, so that is our overall topic today. Let's just do a quick check-in uh, before we get started here. Um, just to, one, to prove to you is the chat works. Uh, and two, I'd love to hear kind of what you're hoping we'll cover today. Um, so just take a moment, point your fingers over the chat button, and type in in a sentence or so uh, one thing that you'd be really disappointed if I don't cover in this session. Yeah. And I'm just going to sit here in silence and wait. I will test your multitasking by um, starting to read these as you're typing. Uh, Luke says, responsive design for websites, mobile, tablet, etc. Ah, interesting. So not a core topic for today. We're going to make a nod to it. Um, but that's, uh, I can give you some follow-up resources on that and uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, some other thoughts people, from people here. So Dave says, a utility to test website usability. Absolutely. We'll talk about some methods for that and then some, uh, um, uh, some actual tools. Uh, Michelle says, sample surveys. Terrific. We'll talk about that. Um, Carlton, ideas on how to keep people coming back to our intranet. So um, we're going to, um, as we talked about, um, think about usability, so just kind of a frame of, is your site usable? How do you know? So why should you care about usability? So if you think about what you hope to accomplish, almost all of those things are helped by a usable site. So you want uh, people to, you want to identify those who need further help, you want to provide information, you want to get more donations, uh, uh, all of those things are likely to be boosted by better, <laughs> by better usability. Um, and thinking about your, your website is you online. So if you present a face that is really hard to use and hard to interact with, um, then people think that about your organization. Then they think your organization is you know, puzzling and hard to interact with. So you want to say, not that that is necessarily what we're saying here about the, um, the Legal Aid Society. Uh, but thinking about the, what your website is saying, in fact, about you. So great, fabulous. You, uh, I've convinced you. You just want to make your website easy to use. It sounds straightforward, but you want to think through. There's key questions here. Who is it usable for? So uh, we're saying people can use it. Who are the people that we are caring about? And you want to think through this in a uh, a clear cut way. So who are your audiences? Um, so uh, are, are you specifically looking to represent, looking for those, sorry, help those who are looking for representation, those with a question, volunteer lawyers, donors, all of those things. So you don't want to be everything to everybody, um, but you can certainly, most websites will have multiple audiences. Um, so you want to think usable for whom, and then usable to do what? So what is that person likely to actually want to do? And one of the things that uh, I actually did, I was a professional usability consultant for, uh, for several years. Um, one of the things that people were always um, uh, kind of surprised by when we started to talk about this was if you went and actually interviewed users or did research around this, they were really surprised at how 
uh, tactical and straightforward most people's needs were. So you may be thinking that they really want detailed information about how to file a form to you know, get their eviction overturned, but likely uh, they really only want to, you know, and maybe they want that, but really they want to know what's going on, you know, how, what's my next step. They don't know that they need a form, or they want your phone number, or you know, all of that good stuff. So they are, they have, they you know, they want the phone number. They want to know what time the event is. Can someone help my grandma? You know, they don't really have likely super sophisticated uh, conceptualization of what they need. They have what they think is a simple question and are looking to an easy answer. Um, so uh, the idea here is then to, so if you think through what your users are looking for, you want to balance your goals with your visitors. Um, so to make sure that your visitors can get what they need, but that there's also the ability to, uh, to make sure that you uh, are able to encourage people to do what you want them to do. So for instance, if what you're trying to do with your website is really to try to encourage those who need legal help to come in to meet with a lawyer in person, then you're going to want to prioritize that against giving them content. If the other, the other side, on the flip side, you really want them to self-serve, um, but they really want to talk to people, <laughs> then you're going to need to try to, to weigh those goals as well. So there's always kind of this balance between what you want and what your visitors want. And finding that right balance is kind of a core of usability. Because honestly, you can't be all things to all people. Um, so you can't say, we are serving everybody on the internet. Um, and we are giving them absolutely every answer to every question they might have. So trying to do that, um, that it will basically affect the usability for everyone. If you try to be all things to all people, you will end up being not much that's useful to anyone. So the priorities are a key piece of usability. All right. So that is kind of at a high level why you should care and the core of thinking about usability. So that is, I know that it sounds commonsensical, but it is as you're thinking about usability, it's absolutely core to define usable for who to do what and to prioritize that stuff. Because you can't just say, in general, the site is usable. All right. So there's three core parts that we're going to talk about um, for usability. Actually, let me pause. Any questions or any insights about uh, any of that stuff that we've talked about so far before we dive into the details here? I know that we have, so um, our, um, our guest speaker who was going to provide some contacts has been detained. Uh, but I know that we've got some folks on the line who have some substantial experience in thinking about website usability. And in fact, I'm going to pick on some people. Um, David Bonebrake, um, if you could unmute yourself, um, what has your experience been in kind of thinking about usability issues with uh, legal aid organizations? Does this what I'm saying resonate? Are there things that you would add? Wow, uh, really put on the spot. Uh, OK. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think the big issue for us uh, is that we have uh, certain base users that have may not be familiar, particularly familiar with using the internet. It's new to them. They may also be dealing with some limitations uh, that might make it more difficult to understand uh, you know, the, the content, the information that they're trying to present. And then on the flip side, because we're in the legal world, the information that we're trying to present oftentimes is incredibly complex and you know very hard for a non-lawyer to get to. So I mean, I think when we're talking about usability, that's always the the big concern for for me. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and Ken mentions. Um, uh, can I dive into or present a thumbnail of a process that prevents trying to be all things to all people? Um, yes, this is very much up my alley. Um, let me um, uh, thank you, uh, David, for for um, the, for pitching in there and on, on a moment's notice. Um, so, um, 
in thinking about this idea of preventing being all things to all people, I think the number one is to, to start by defining what your goals are for your website and to prioritize them. So to basically say, all right, we can't effectively have 30 goals for our website. Uh, we need to you know, uh, prioritize what are the top three or top five. Um, and then to do the same with audiences. Okay, what are the top three or five audiences at most that we are attempting to support with the website? It can then be really useful to brainstorm uh, your audience's goals. So to basically say, all right, well, so we've identified our own goals. Um, if we think about this particular audience, so we have a uh, low-income person who is struggling with a legal issue. Um, what are their goals likely to be? And really to put themselves, put yourself in their shoes to kind of go beyond the obvious, like, okay, well, they want help. Um, in what way do they want help? Um, I bet, so you guys certainly know these answers way better than me, but I bet a lot of people want to talk to a human. Um, so to think, so at least to acknowledge that th this is what people want and then to be able to deal with that on your site. Um, so um, uh, with the idea that, OK, maybe we can't let them talk to a human, uh, but we want to have front and center an acknowledgment of the fact that it, you, it, here's what we're going to do instead, and we know that you might want, maybe not in these words, but we know you might want to talk to a person, but here's something that's just as good. Um, maybe they want, in, in general, one of the problems of you know, people who are providing lots of detailed content, like you are, is that uh, people, what people want is they want an easy answer to their question. And in fact, an easy answer to their question often does not exist. Um, so then it's attempting to, um, to help them to understand on the site what is likely to be easily answered and what is not likely to be easily answered. So to try to set expectations early um, as to what they're likely to be able to find out of the website, to make sure that they're not looking for something that cannot be found. So that's some, some thoughts there. Um, terrific. All right. Um, so let us dive in and talk about some of the um, uh, some of the actual um, uh, uh, sorry aspects to usability. Starting with navigation. I think often when people think about usability, they start with navigation. So, uh, and the, the main gist here is making sure that your web visitors can find what they need. And the home page itself is a critical piece to this. Um, so it is not the only piece to this, but it is an important one. So to the home page is a really an, an important opportunity for you to set expectations as to what there might be. Um, so uh, having that be a map for people to say, oh, look, so we're looking here at Iowa Legal Aid. Um, I can get information about disability stuff. I can get information here about education stuff. I can get information about work stuff. Um, interestingly, like for instance, if you think of me, I, so I am coming in, just the, the scenario before, I am being evicted. Um, so I need help with my eviction. Um, this map would actually probably say to me, that there is not, there may not be anything here on eviction because I see disability, I see education, I see work, I don't see anything about housing, um, and so that's actually a really useful. And I actually, I suspect that that is not the case, um, and that's a really important thing to think about the user's mental model. Um, that I am not necessarily thinking about self-help or consumer and small claims court as things. I don't actually know what of those I need. I am saying I have this problem and I need a, a solution to it. So to uh, map uh, things on your home page to help assure visitors that they are in the right place and that you have the information that they want, if, they, if you do. Or to, on the, on the flip side, to tell people who uh, you know that you, who frequently come but you know you can't help, uh, to tell them up front that you don't have the information they want so they don't spend lots of time looking for it. A search box is also really important uh, for people who are looking for detailed answers to questions. Many people will plan to kind of just skip 
the navigation and go straight to the search. Uh, one of the comments that um, that Terry with the Illinois Legal Aid um, organization, Illinois Legal Aid had uh, when we were kind of talking in preparation for this is that they have found that the search is an absolutely critical piece of their. Um, uh, of their, the usability of their sites, that tons of people rely on it, and when they do user testing, most people default to it. So that's another another critical thing to think about. Um, and here's what happens if you try to show everything at once. <laughs> if you don't prioritize and you just, in the kind of the home page is a free-for-all to let anybody in the organization put things up there. This is a usability nightmare. Uh, if I come in, obviously this is not a legal aid site because I didn't want to like make fun of legal aid organizations. Um, so this I, is very difficult for me to try to figure out what's going on, where I might go. Logically, I'm at GoDaddy, so this is a, um, a place to buy a domain address. Logically, I probably want to buy a domain if I'm here. Uh, and it's here, but it's not super uh, central. Like, so there's here, there's here. In fact, this free extras button looks kind of more like the action button than my form. Like, there's all sorts of problems with this. But the idea is to define a finite number of, uh, of things that uh, you want someone to do uh, or you think that they will want to do off the home page and make those clear options. Um, so, for instance, here is actually the Illinois Legal Aid Online site um, with a, uh, a very clear set of options as to uh, what it is that you might want. You know, so their site is actually supporting uh, attorneys statewide, so they are actually supporting legal aid organizations, and that is a a core middle option, but they basically say, all right, do you want legal help? Are you a legal aid attorney? Are you potentially a pro bono attorney? This stuff can be very useful uh, as long as people can easily identify which of these people they are. Um, this is it's a really important thing to keep in mind um, that people may not think of themselves as you think of them. So for instance, if you ask uh, for instance, um, do you have a small claims issue? This is kind of an obvious one. Do you have a small claims issue? Do you have a bigger civil matter? Uh, people, no one would know because that's not the way they're thinking about their issue. Um, so to make sure that you actually give people the options that they can identify with. Um, and featuring a key thing with teaser can be a great way to not have everything at once. Um, so to basically say, all right, so here's a box in which we are going to put one latest news thing. Uh, and that's basically the real estate that latest news gets. Or here is the real estate for connecting um, with, uh, this is Montana Legal Services, um, via Facebook, Twitter, other things. Um, so to, as opposed to saying, all right, we need to put a huge glom of text on the home page to say that we're going to uh, make it clear what it is and then make a link to it. I'm just going to pause to see if there's any questions, thoughts. Anybody have anything to add about home pages before I dive a little more into navigation specifically? Into the chat, uh, if you are unmuted, you can shout it out or you can uh, mute yourself. Or, sorry, unmute yourself. So the navigation is also key. So it's a also a map to your site. So the things that you have in your navigation bar are telling people what is available on your site. So for instance, we've got the idea over here is that we can have, uh, you know, uh, that, that we're divided by services, employment, volunteer, like, so this is actually, it's kind of a, kind of a hodgepodge. I'm not sure who this is. I apologize. Um, so over here, you can see that there are, like, for instance, oh, look, there are publications. There are resources. Oh, there's employment opportunities. So this is kind of a map as to things that one might have. 
Um, and here is a, so this is um, uh, stateside legal. Um, and here is a strong uh, statement of, uh, we have information in a lot of languages. Um, and here it is. Um, so even if um, this is an interesting kind of just branding statement in addition to a usability aspect, uh, even if I don't actually speak Somali, um, the fact that there is a Somali translation is a, uh, it, it kind of says something about this organization. Um, let's see, um, Rosita asks, are there any must-have on home page, um, on home pages, standards like contact us, feedback, et cetera? Um, I would say that certainly, so in general, you want to think through what key things many of your constituents are going to want to do and then make sure that you have those. Uh, I think an obvious one would be either a contact us or a kind of generally uh, contact us is typically below about us. I would say certainly usability best standards, would, uh, best practices would have either contact us or your actual contact information on your home page with the idea that probably it's got to vary, obviously, from organization to organization, but that maybe 10% of the traffic to your website is simply looking for contact information. So it's a lot. Um, let's see. Um, Brian makes a great point that a lot of people expect search. Yes, yeah, certainly if you have a search, there is no question it should be on your, your home page. And especially if you have a lot of content to, uh, to navigate through, as many of you do, or you have a lot of legal content, um, then a search can be really helpful. Um, terrific. Uh, Brian suggests a privacy policy. Um, certainly, it uh, doesn't hurt to have a privacy policy in your uh, footer bar. Um, I think, as well, uh, the privacy policy could um, show up in places where you are actually asking people for information. So I'm not sure it's 100% uh, critical to have on the home page, but it's certainly useful to have somewhere. Um, yeah, and Brian is mentioning that a lot of people expect search, especially if your site has more than 50 pages. I agree with that. That it is um, uh, certainly, if it's something you don't have, it is well worth considering for the usability uh, perspective. All right, so as you're thinking about navigation, a frequent question is, should your navigation be wide? So basically, should you have you know, maybe page one, page two, page three, page four, possibly, you know, 17 uh, different high-level categories linked to from your navigation? Or should it be deep uh, so that you have uh, only three sections, but under each section there's a bunch of hierarchy? Um, so there's been a, um, there's been uh, some, a lot of misinformation spread on this particular information, I think, that uh, at some point, someone did a research study um, that said uh, seven things is the right amount of thing. I think the actual study was seven things is what people can kind of easily parse and comprehend in a glance. And that got co-opted into meaning seven is the magical number when it comes to website usability. So there should be seven of everything. Um, you shouldn't have more than seven things on your, uh, in your nav bar. You shouldn't have more than seven things in a drop down. You shouldn't have seven things in a list. Uh, this screenshot is a list in which this is particular nonsense. Um, this is a list of, a, of all uh, events out of a system that we use to track events. And they give me seven results, although you can tell that there's hundreds of them. So this is just useless. Um, so this is total nonsense. This has been, so many, many people have heard it, which is why I bring it up. Um, but there is, this does not relate to website usability in the way that it has come to mean. Um, so basically, ignore the rule of seven as it comes to websites. Instead, you want to think about something that is actually, from a technical perspective, called sent. Um, so it doesn't matter if there's a lot of clicks involved if each click is e easy and obvious. So if it takes 18 clicks to get there, but the user is uh, finds each click totally easily, uh, well, 18 is a big example. But, you know, if there's a lot of clicks, as long as it is very clear where they are going and what they should click on next, 
So logically, the wide versus deep conversation would be, should I only have seven things on my home page um, so that, uh, that is, so they, there's not a lot of things to choose from? Uh, but then I need to have very deep structures underneath all of those? Or should I have 30 things on my home page so that people can uh, have less clicks to get where they're going? So the, the rule of seven tends to um, conflict with the rule of how many clicks, that the, the fewer the clicks, the better. Um, and I would say that both of those are not relevant compared to whether the user knows, can find what they are looking for quickly, and it's clear what they should do. So in fact, some of the very highest tested web pages, which in fact may be very uh, applicable to you guys, are essentially things that look like a directory. So like the home page is, OK, here's a category. And underneath the category, there are, uh, you know, so maybe we have um, uh, civil matters. And underneath that category, we have divorce, we have child custody, we have uh, housing, we have, you know, et cetera. And you might have 40 topics on your home page that are organized into categories. It doesn't matter that there's 40 there as long as people can navigate around them and they can find what to click. Um, this also means that wording is essential. So having something that's vague and short is going to freak people out. It's going to make them pause and be they're not going to be able to follow the scent as well. Um, then having something that is uh, has more words and is uh, less vague. Um, so the idea of you know 60 plus elder law that is pretty clear. I, I think that most people would know what that is. Um, things like health, pensions. Um, so we've got uh, clear cut words um, that are meaningful to your actual users. Um, and if you are, your users are not super literate, uh, not English speakers, um, all of those things, you really need to think about the words that you're going to use that will be meaningful to them. So the you know, 10 cent word that is super accurate may, in fact, not be the right word to, um, to convey what you are going with. <laughs> And just a quick one, don't fight your visitors. Um, this is uh, something that you see, uh, uh, unfortunately, too much um, that people, uh, so for instance, let's use again the, the case of, uh, so some organizations really want to have their, um, uh, their folks show up in person. Uh, so they're trying, they're, if from their website, they are trying to get people to meet with a lawyer, either over the phone or in person. And some people are really trying to get people to self-serve. Uh, the, the people themselves uh, have preference, <laughs> likely. Um, and you don't want to construct your whole website specifically to get people to do the opposite of what they want to do. You want to attempt to find some middle ground where everyone is happy. Uh, so things like providing quick links. So like for instance, if you are trying to get people to self-serve and you know that people want to call you, uh, maybe there is a quick link of uh, like how and when to contact us, in which you explain you know, that you can call, there will likely be a way, you know, here's uh, when this really makes sense, and hey, maybe in, it, here's other ways in which you might self-serve. So not to hide your phone number to try to get people not to call you, but instead to explain to them that we understand that you want to call us. Here's our response to that question. Um, so basically, quick links um, tend to be a really nice way to kind of be like, all right, here's things that we know that people are really looking for. Um, so we're just going to um, uh, to pop them forward in the site. I want to just we had uh, mobile was kind of miscellaneously buried in here. Um, you also it's really important as you're thinking about navigation that you remember uh, visitors who are coming in on mobile devices. Um, so people on mobile devices uh, are generally so if you assume, so if they're on like an iPad or a tablet. Um, then they're probably seeing a pretty reasonable view of your website. Um, if they're coming in on a cell phone, they are likely seeing something very different than what you would see on a computer, um, which is either going to be 
um, a uh, a microscopic version of your site, so a site which is your entire website shrunk down to be tiny, um, or they're going to see a uh, upper left hand corner of your site um, at full scale, but they can only they need to scroll uh, horizontally in order to see things unless you've done something different um, to, to support them. So a couple of things to think about here. Um, so certainly step number one is simply thinking about those experiences. So if someone comes in to a minuscule website, then logically having some, like for instance, large navigation buttons that they can, so maybe making the nav larger than would otherwise seem appropriate so that they are findable and clickable in a minuscule cell phone screen might be useful. Um, thinking about the upper left-hand corner um, to see it, it's a, if, if a bunch of people are going to come into the upper left-hand corner of your screen, are there things that are there which are useful? Um, so that's step number one. Or then thinking, if you're thinking about mobile usability and you want to go down the road, there is also the possibility of, uh, so someone mentioned up front, uh, responsive design um, is kind of the, the cutting edge way to deal with this. Uh, responsive design means that the site itself is coded so that your template reacts to what device you are, the user is looking at it with. So you basically, it might show this uh, format with uh, two columns when you are um, on a um, on a regular uh, uh, sorry when you're on a like a computer but when you're on a phone it perhaps uh, drops this side nav shows only this uh, this core piece um, or you could think about um, having a mobile specific site um, so what we're looking at here this is Pine Tree uh, Legal Assistance who has a specific mobile website. Um, which is, you can see, it's a much pared down version of, of this particular site. Um, so unfortunately, uh, both of these options, it might in fact be, depending on uh, how you're currently uh, managing the content in your site, it might actually be easier to create a whole other legal uh, site to kind of quickly navigate people into uh, into your content than it is to create something with responsive design. Um, yeah, responsive design generally requires that you're using a content management system that will support that uh, without a vast amount of rework, uh, or that you actually rebuild your site, unfortunately. All right, any questions, comments, thoughts on this whole idea of navigation and home pages and remembering the mobile user for navigation before we move on to talk about uh, thinking about um, usable content itself. Uh, Carlton asks, is there a site where you can test your site with, uh, with an iPhone? Uh, yes, absolutely. If you, I don't actually know the site off the top of my head, but it is, uh, there are a lot of uh, emulators. Um, if you type cell phone emulator into just Google, I'm actually doing it right now. Um, it will. Um, there are a lot of options that will allow you to select the type of phone um, that you're looking at, um, and uh, and then choose to see your um, uh, your site in it. And so, in fact, what I've just gotten here is um, www.mobilephoneemulator.com. Um, so. um, Ken asks. Um, do we still see folks making mobile-specific sites rather than using this responsive design to accommodate mobile? Uh, it's a great question. Um, it depends on what one's goals are. Um, so it's likely to be cheaper um, to, if you're trying to, if people are going to be doing just a few things uh, on the website, so if from a mobile device they're almost certainly going to be looking for your phone number and the schedule of events, for instance, um, it may well be cheaper to build a mobile site than to try to uh, make their entire uh, current website responsive. Um, if you are building a new site, I definitely would say that it uh, makes sense to make the, um, the site responsive. Uh, it's a matter of whether you can uh, uh, fulfill the goals you need without 
uh, getting the basically the entire site online. If you're trying to to allow people to navigate all of your legal information, uh, hundreds and hundreds of pages on it through a uh, through a phone, then likely that's going to mean a responsive design for your um, for your current website, or else you have two copies of your content, which is going to be annoying. Ken, I'm going to pick on you just because I know you. Um, <laughs> I, I'm curious um, if you have kind of thoughts or insights or um, other things to, to mention in kind of this whole regard to the idea of navigation and uh, no, I mean, I think I generally don't have thoughts or insights, but I could offer that I really think that the principle of going no more than seven deep is really a nice solid one. The other one is that in as much as possible, the use of breadcrumbs are just such a, um, a really solid navigational aid so that when folks are doing um, the planning and the implementation, it's like, okay, how do my users back out or know where they are in, in the right. site? Um, right. That way, hopefully, they'll they'll stick around if they if it's a familiar landscape or a landscape that they understand. Um, yeah, and the other part maybe would be, and and this is probably something you're going to cover um, separately. Is uh, I think that in um, the legal aid community, we rely a lot on PDFs, and I I kind of look okay. at it through like a security standpoint. Is if that is a common infection vector, you're asking people for a plugin. It'd be interesting to hear from you what you're seeing folks moving towards in terms of like e-paper, whether they're embedding it, whether they have kind of the PDF scraped and put on the site and then a separate download link. That type of stuff would be interesting. Yes, that is a very interesting. And in fact, as we think ahead to the accessibility uh, seminar that's uh, that's coming up uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, also a very key topic for that because there's a lot of um, tools that are available for folks um, if, for HTML content that is not available through a PDF. Um, so in general, uh, usability, and I would love people's comments. Um, uh, if, if in fact you've done some. Um, uh, if you've done some thinking about usability of PDF documents, if you would uh, type just a little something in the chat, even including just I have, so I can call on you to talk about it. Uh, general practices around PDFs in the usability world is that a PDF is generally something that is designed to be printed rather than designed to be read. Um, so if you have a read on screen, excuse me. Um, so if you have something that really needs to be 30 pages long, um, it might make sense to make it a PDF so that it is easily print outable. Um, uh, however, you would need to then assume that less people are going to download it and print it out than would look at it on a screen. So you're going to lose some people uh, in the translation from you know actually clicking on something and opening it up and, and scrolling through it. Um, so in general, the recommendation from a usability perspective is to put it in as HTML text on a page unless there is some substantial reason that people are going to want to print it. Like, like a form, for instance, is a good example of obviously you can't, if, if you're going to ask people to file a form, um, that needs to be a something that is printed and printed pristinely. So it would need to be an attachment um, or it needs to be a download. Um, yeah, content-wise, I think that it almost certainly uh, li it likely makes sense to for it to be HTML content as opposed to as a website content rather than a PDF. I don't know. You thought yourself on that, Ken? So I had to mute myself. Yeah, I, you know, I've, I'm I'm kind of torn because there is the functionality, like particularly in terms of branding, etc. If someone just prints the web page. The, our brand wouldn't be as strong. The uniformity of, of kind of like the printing standards would be completely different. So absolutely, like for forms, for sure. I really like how you kind of set that up, Laura. That yeah, forms yeah. definitely uh, PDF. And and I'm kind of torn because I think most people, um, particularly in uh, lower resource communities, oftentimes don't have a printer. So right. kind of how do they see it? Just or, just yeah. how you yeah, just how you kind of broke that down. How if yeah. it's a 50 page like PDF, where 10 pages of instructions, five are forms, and five are like optional appendices or addendums, and you've lost so many people just there. But that's helpful right. how you framed it. 
Right, right, absolutely. Yeah, and I would say that in thinking about kind of the, the branding and, and your logo and stuff like that, definitely agree that it's uh, way easier to make something look good and professional and polished in a PDF. So that's part of kind of the weighing the um, – uh, your goals versus your users' goals. Um, so presumably your users do not care uh, whether or not it, well, they would claim to not care whether or not it looked polished. Um, whether it looks polished might, in fact, impact their perception of how accurate the information is and stuff like that. Uh, but to kind of to say, okay, so here's a case in which this is really critical um, uh, for us to look really buttoned up, so we're going to uh, balance these needs, um, and it comes out to a PDF. Fantastic. All right. Let's talk a little bit about content itself. Um, so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because I think that this is something that is uh, fairly uh, talked about in the legal aid community. But certainly we're remiss if we talk about usability without talking about the content itself. So it doesn't matter how easy it is for people to get to the information about what to do if they're being evicted. If the information itself is uh, not useful or is baffling or is 50 pages long with no paragraph breaks. Uh, so you want to um, so to start by, so as we were just thinking about content, you want to start by making sure that people know what you do. Um, this is surprisingly often overlooked, um, that in your homepage or someplace close to your homepage, you want to make sure that people actually just understand what services you provide. Because it's, it's obvious to you, and so you sometimes forget to put it on you know, someplace obvious on your website. Um, you want to, um, here's another commonsensical thing, um, you want to provide the information that people really want to know. So what do they need to make a decision? What are the key things that they need to know? Um, so you don't need to tell them absolutely every detail of everything right away. If people are very frequently asking just 10 questions which are easily answered, then you would certainly want to surface those uh, to make it easy. Uh, by the way, there's a conversation going on on the chat in regard to user testing, which is fantastic. Um, we're actually going to talk about user testing in a reasonable amount of detail um, coming up. Um, and I'll def I've definitely made note that Michelle has been doing it, so, um, so we will uh, check in with her. Um, more text is not better. Um, in fact, more text is worse um, than simply, so every user wants really only one sentence that answers exactly the question they have. Um, that is probably not an achievable goal uh, because it's not possible to figure out exactly what each user wants to know. Um, but lots and lots of information, especially lots of text on a page in a way that's not easy to scan like this is, um, is, is certainly not better. Um, you want to be brief. Um, so you want to try to summarize when you can. You want to try to put summaries at the top um, to allow people to scan as opposed to read. Um, so almost everybody on a website, it's been shown through research, um, does not uh, read through word by word um, uh, as they're going to the site. Instead, they are... Um, uh, instead, they are. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm amused by the chat in which we're having a discussion about bringing in your mom or undergrad students <laughs> in order to use a test. Absolutely. Um, so, um, in general, the rule of thumb is that you want to, as opposed to something that you would hand out in print, you want to cut the word house a uh, word count in half or more for online stuff. Um, you want to make it scannable. You want to uh, make it easy for something to catch their eye and for them to kind of orientate themselves in a page so they know what they're looking for. Um, chunking text can be a great way to do this. Um, so uh, basically this, for instance, is a um, uh, kind of an index at the top of a page before they, um, you ask them, you answer them in detail. Um, so this allows me to uh, kind of get a quick scan of what's on the page, and I can click on a link. Um, and in fact, there's a similar, you can achieve a similar goal simply by making like, the questions very bold headers. Um, so it could be a really long page, but the questions are bolded uh, and large um, so that uh, people can see it. All right, bullet points. Um, so things that are bulleted out with um, uh, key headers like this, 
um, is going to be a lot more easily scannable than entire paragraphs or giant chunks of text. So you want to generally try to create white space on the page so that it's possible to uh, scan. Um, and you want to think about equal access to your information, something that we already have, um, uh, so we're going to talk a lot about in, in a couple of weeks when we talk about accessibility. Um, so think about, as we talk about mobile users, think about foreign language speakers, think about people who are blind or can't use a keyboard as effectively as others. Um, all of those people are usable. Um, and you want to create high text contrast so people can actually read your stuff. Um, this is a typical issue in terms of uh, having a graphic designer uh, who's used to print working on the web. So this is a beautiful layout, uh, but we've got light blue on dark blue, <laughs> which is going to be uh, slower to read for anyone. So even so, you probably are looking at this and saying, "Well, I can read that." It's going to take you longer to read than if something is really high contrast, um, and it also is going to uh, be harder to read uh, for those who have some visual disability. So you're basically uh, lowering or raising the bar as to who can actually read your site. Um, multimedia can also be a great way to kind of chunk your content to help yep. people to get audio and video links uh, for those who might have trouble reading. All right, so we're jamming out to someone's hold music. Um, unfortunately, I apologize. I don't think other than muting all of the lines, which is then going to mute me, uh, there's any way to get rid of this. Um, all right. Are there any questions on kind of content usability before we do a quick uh, run through of form design and then talk about user testing? But questions into the chat. All right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about form usability. So there's a huge school of thought. You can easily do a hour and a half session just about usability of forms. But here are some uh, kind of highlights here. Um, so you want to make sure that you use the right form element for the job. Um, so for instance, radio buttons are select one, while check boxes are select some or all. Um, if you give people check boxes, but you then validate to make sure that they've checked only one, that's going to be really, uh, really uh, annoying. Hang on just a second. Uh, have I fallen out of the number? Uh, I am not, Brian, I am on, so Brian is trying to troubleshoot uh, the music. I am on the conference call number. If I mute the lines and then hit start six, it tells me that it's, uh, I cannot be unmuted because the conference is in um, uh, presenter only mode. So unfortunately, I'm not sure that that's a good option. Um, uh, thinking through just in terms of space, um, so radio button check boxes, uh, uh, drop downs. So if the list of options are likely to be um, uh, to be obvious to people, um, then uh, you can, it's useful to have a drop down. If the, uh, the options are not likely to be obvious, then a drop down uh, kind of slows people down because they can't figure out, they can't see the list, and they need to scroll through the list to try to figure out what's going on. And um, make sure, so uh, when you're looking at usability for transactional things like forms, um, uh, thinking about what happens when something goes wrong is a big piece of usability. So for instance, if someone doesn't fill out a mandatory field, what actually happens? Um, do you get a nice uh, message that tells you what's required? Do you get a less nice message that tells you you need to fill out all the mandatory fields, but it doesn't tell you which? Uh, you get a, an incredibly not nice message that uh, takes you to a web page where it has thrown up server error because it's attempted to um, uh, log something without all of the information. So thinking through what happens when in each of the circumstances in which someone could do something wrong. All right. So 
that was our overview of the various kinds of usability, so kind of the overall best practices that you should be thinking about. Um, and actually, in the world of usability, that type of stuff is often called heuristics. So you might do a heuristic audit of your website, which basically is a fancy word to mean uh, uh, you are going through a checklist of best practices and you're comparing your site to it. Um, so that is actually a very a valid way to do a usability audit. Um, but there's also a lot of user testing options, um, which I'm going to go through in, in next. But before I do that, any um, questions or thoughts in regard to forum usability or any of the other best practices that we have um, talked through? Uh, Nancy is asking me how to spell something. Oh, heuristic. I was trying to figure out what word I had said that uh, she's asking about. Let me just type heuristic in here. Um, it's approximately that. Uh, it might be E and the U might be in the other order. <laughs> All right. Um, so how do you know if it's working? So there's a couple of different things to think about. User tests, surveys, web analytics. Um, so let's start by talking about user tests. And Michelle, um, you had mentioned in the chat before that you've done some. Um, and it sounds like you've done some that are on kind of the more gorilla side um, that are uh, low tech, which I think is, uh, would be a great thing to share. I just got to warn you that in maybe uh, five minutes or so, I'd love if you could uh, share a little about your experience with user testing. So. Um, sure, no problem. Great. Thank you. Um, so let me do just a quick overview as to what this might mean, and then we'll hear what you've been doing. Um, so the idea of a user test is to help you understand how the site is being used by real people to meet actual goals. So it's easy to think about your site in uh, kind of this idealistic way, um, but as soon as you, as, as real people interact with it, things that seemed obvious to you tend to fall apart. Um, so in fact, even like the greatest usability people on earth would never say, I don't need to use a test because I know what I'm doing. Uh, they would say instead, I know what I'm doing because I use a test. Um, so you want to recruit some people. Um, so if you want to, so depending on how kind of far down this road you want to go. So I'll start with actually the last sentence first. Uh, any testing is better than none. Um, so Michelle was mentioning getting her mom to, um, to navigate through it. Um, way better than no testing at all. Um, to have somebody, so in fact, having somebody in the organization who wasn't involved in creating it, testing, uh, test it is better than nothing at all. Um, but ideally, you would want to get people who would actually use the site. Um, and you would want to get three to four people for each type of thing you want to test. Uh, so the general idea here is that um, uh, one person could just be totally nuts and give you all sorts of weird information. Uh, two people could disagree with each other, and then you have no idea what to do. Three or four people, you then begin to see common issues and themes, and it begins to become fairly clear cut um, in a lot of cases. So you want to take these, these people, you want to just sit down with them uh, in front of a computer. Um, you want to let them drive, give them the mouse and the keyboard. Um, and uh, at, so we're going to talk about goals in just a second. But the idea is that you would either tell them to find, to give them a scenario and ask them to find something. So to say, all right, so let's say, uh, this is my favorite example, let's say you've just been evicted and you don't know what to do, you feel like you need legal help. Where, what would you do on this site? That can be a really interesting uh, way to see people's mental models. Um, you could also ask them to, um, uh, to take on a task uh, that they come up with. So uh, think through over the past month of a legal question that you had. Great. Now, would you, uh, what would you do on this site if you wanted? So maybe you would start with, do you feel like you could get an answer to that question on this site? Which, that can also be a really interesting question both ways around. That they think that they can't, and they can, or they think they can, and they can't. Um, uh, and then, uh, if they think of one on the fly, to they can explore on their own terms. And you can see what they, in fact, would actually do. It's a little more naturalistic than, um, than asking them um, a, a kind of a preset task. Um, and the idea is that you want to 
simply let them drive. Um, and you don't want you want to if the, you want to get them to try to to talk if you can. Um, so by asking them things like, so what are you thinking as you look in this page? Or I see you're looking for something. What are you looking for? Um, you want to resist um, as much as you can helping them. Uh, so it can be kind of painful watching someone look for a link which to your eye is obviously right in front of them. Um, but if you be, if you're like, oh yeah, so you're looking for this, yeah, it's right here. Um, you're defeating the purpose of the user test uh, because, in fact, if you test four users and none of the four users were able to find this thing that you think is obvious, then you've got a problem with it. Um, then something is non-obvious about it, and you need to to address that. Um, so it's often useful, often a problem in usability testing is one person does it who is the key champion of user needs, and they uh, present the results, and the staff says, oh, but like, who did you test? Those people are just, you know, they, they, you tested idiot users. Um, that's not real problems that real people would have. Um, and so, in fact, involving staff in some way, so to, uh, in fact, just have uh, you can probably have two or possibly three people sitting with the, so like one or two people in addition to the person facilitating the test could be sitting in front of the computer watching what the user does. You could use like a screen capture software to at least get the, um, uh, the mouse movements of that user. Uh, you could video record it, so you could set up a really uh, kind of gangster videotaping station by simply um, uh, aiming a video camera at the screen and getting the audio as well. Um, it's really useful to be able to show people, um, yes, I know you think this is obvious, but let me show you three people struggling with it. It's very powerful, and it's hard to, it's hard to argue with. All right, so before we move on to surveys, um, Michelle, you want to talk a little about kind of what you've done in terms of user testing and what it's been useful for? Sure. We actually do it pretty often here. Um, it, I'm from Legal Aid Society of Orange County, and we have a system we use called ICANN for document assembly. And so when we have people that come to our clinics, rather than having individual paralegals or law students sit down and help them fill out their paperwork, we go through the information with them, the legal information that they need, and then we sit them in a computer and we have them begin an ICANN module, which um, is they're written at a fifth grade literacy level, and they ask you questions that subsequently fills out a form. So if you're at the UD clinic and you need to file an answer, you can go to the clinic, receive all the information you need, and then fill out the form. What we do then is so we allow the attorneys and our paralegals to kind of give the information, and then they oversee people using the forms. And as they come across things that maybe are difficult terms to understand, they take note of that. Um, if, they're, if, it, if the concept seems to move too quickly, they make note of that. And then they can help people go through it. That's one way we've done it. Another way we've done it is, um, we do a lot of surveys, and for, so for bankruptcy, we do the same thing. We have a bankruptcy clinic, and then after the bankruptcy clinic, we move people into our computer lab. It helps to have a computer lab on site, um, and then have um, that people go through the module and complete their forms for bankruptcy, and we have just one attorney that's in there, and then she hands out a survey afterwards that asks a lot of questions about how, how the module was to use, did you understand what you were being asked, she also checks their forms when they're done to make sure that they're accurate so that we know that the software is mapping correctly. But we recently did a project with Orange County Court and one with Smart Forms, and they had designed a Smart Forms interface um, with legal forms, put it up on the web, and thought everybody was going to be able to use it. And even our internal team here, attorneys and techno technical staff, pulled it up, and we tried to use it, and none of us could. It took us two hours to get through one form and that was with error checks and everything else. So we pulled in some of our, we started to reroute some of our family law clinic clients um, into the computer lab to do that. We recorded it for the court, and then we took all of our findings and we presented them to the court and said, we need a different solution for this because the uh, self-represented clients that we, or self-represented parties that we typically assist can't fill out these forms. They are just not intuitive for our client community and how can we make it better, and what do we need to work around, how do we um, maybe put it in inside of a container that allows us to chat with people when we're using it. So those are kind of the three big areas where we've, we've kind of done it. But we do it 
with most of our sites. And, and I really do, honestly, when I come up with a new site for um, one of our services or one of our partners or a partnership, I, I have my mom go through it because my mom can use Facebook. She's great at it, but when it comes to using a site like that, she wants to know, you know, iteratively where are the links? Are the links here? I have my husband go through it. A lot of times, you know, our, our staff will go through it as well, but they're, they're kind of accustomed to going through it. So I have to pick people that aren't used to going to legal websites. Maybe it's a mommy group or something like that and just get people that aren't accustomed to the terminology or, or, or regular web, website, you know, information gathering and have them go through it. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. That, that was really useful. Um, yeah, and I think that, uh, so one of the takeaways, uh, I think that, um, uh, is, I think is valid for almost every organization, is user testing is often considerably easier than you think it's going to be, especially if you don't, you know, say, all right, it needs to be this fantastic piece of research that's going to, you know, be university juried. Um, that instead it's, all right, so I'm going to get, one, I'm going to call up a friend of mine who doesn't work in the legal world, and we're going to sit down and uh, walk through this after hours before we go out and get a beer. Um, that is, that's user testing. That's, um, you know, it, it, they may or may not be a fabulous representation of your target user, but if you know that you know that if she has a lot of trouble with it, then she may be, in fact, higher functioning than a lot of people. So if she has trouble with it, then other people will likely too. Um, so, and I also I love the idea that you know you've got people in for clinics anyway um, to uh, ask them to do things online or kind of ask them as a maybe an additional thing after they've met with a lawyer. Uh, would you mind? We are creating this form. Do you have another five minutes to um, to sit down and to test this with us? And if they're already in your office, uh, what a perfect opportunity to to try something out. Fantastic. Any other thoughts, questions in regard to user testing before we talk a little bit about surveys and then just a very brief overview of website analytics? Into the chat. We suddenly have beautifully silent phone lines. It's very exciting. All right. So let's talk a little about surveys. Um, so if you want a lot, so uh, user testing is really good, or interviews, so kind of just asking people questions, um, really good if you want uh, detailed information about how people are thinking about your site, what particular things are problematic. Um, if you want um, a lot of people to answer a few questions, um, then uh, a survey might be a better option. Um, so asking something like, why are you visiting this website today? Um, so this was clearly something to do with Martin Luther King. Um, so <laughs> uh, it, that's actually, so when typically, um, if for instance, like if you were in the line of work I was in where I would do um, website audits and then recommendations uh, as someone was doing a redesign or a, uh, a tweak, um, you would often, we would often do um, surveys, uh, so what we'd call an intercept survey, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute, that pops up on the website itself and ask very basic things like what are you hoping to achieve today, uh, uh, were you able to find what you wanted to find, uh, like with which of these groups would you most identify? Um, just kind of feel getting a sense as to who are the people who are coming to the site, what are they doing on the site, are they successfully able to do it? Um, this is good. It tends to um, it tends to not be shocking in its content, but it tends to very much underline kind of what we talked earlier that people tend to have very basic and tactical desires on your website, which is often useful data to have if you have people who are advocating for uh, very complicated solutions and, uh, and, and information, that, the, that likely the vast majority of people are, look, are looking for a question, an answer to a tactical question. Uh, whether or not that tactical question is answerable or not is going to, you know, is going to depend. And it may be that, you know, your entire 1,000-page website is necessary in order to make sure that, you know, 60% of site users can get their tactical question answered. Um, but it's often useful to kind of see what it is and that people are, are, are think they're doing on your site and whether or not they've actually been able to do it. 
couple ways to, um, to do a survey. Um, so you could email a link to the survey to your entire list. Um, so this would be so a list of clients, a list of lawyers, a list of uh, people who in general are on your email list. This would be a more typical way to get information about uh, kind of what people's priorities are in terms of what you're taking on or what you're providing content for. Um, N10 itself, what we're looking at is a, a, a membership organization, so um, they uh, logically might ask questions about you know membership benefits or things that you might want. Uh, intercept surveys um, are what I uh, just mentioned that you you have something that perhaps pops up um, when you come to the site. You've probably seen these on websites. So basically, uh, it might appear right away, or it might uh, be delayed that it'll pop up after you've been on the site for you know four minutes or two minutes or something uh, to try to filter out people who have just like randomly arrived but then left again because it wasn't really the site they wanted to be at. Um, you create an inter intercept survey using a, uh, so most of the common survey tools, like SurveyMonkey, for instance, um, will let you create something that can be used as an intercept survey. Um, you put it in your site by um, embedding the uh, piece of code uh, into the web page itself. So you need someone with a bit of technical savvy to get the internet intercept survey in there. Um, but it is not particularly um, complicated um, to do. So a little bit of tech savvy, not a vast amount of tech savvy. Um, the low-end survey market has been uh, simplified by the fact that SurveyMonkey has bought Zoomerang, which was the other lo uh, big widely used low-end option. Um, so SurveyMonkey is a reasonable default option unless you have complicated needs or reasons to not use it. Um, so it has a free option. It's $20 a month for uh, pretty much most of the functionality that most of us would need. And I just wanted to take a nod to um, the fact that web analytics are also uh, pretty useful in figuring out what people want on your website. Um, so uh, the idea of um, uh, sorry, um, of going through something, so in uh, putting something like Google Tool, Google Analytics on your website, which also involves embedding a piece of code, and then uh, taking a look at the traffic uh, that's occurred after you embedded that code to see what pages they looked at on your site, what are the most popular pages, what paths did they take through the site, so to be able to know that, in fact, uh, in fact, another thing that. Um, uh, that colleague passed on to me in regards to their legal aid site, uh, so Terry at, at Illinois Legal Aid, was that in fact um, about, I've forgotten the exact numbers, but some whopping percent, like 60 or 70 percent, um, are coming to their site not through their home page, but through something else, generally through a, uh, an organic search term. So someone searched on Google uh, for, you know, Illinois you know, eviction, um, and uh, came to this particular page on their on your site. Uh, so and that can be a really important thing to get your head around from a usability perspective, is that people are coming to your site from all over the place and not necessarily just entering um, through your home page itself. So you need to think through, make sure that it's clear what the site is and what people should expect to be able to get there, um, even if they don't come through your home page. All right, I have a quick wrap up. Um, any questions or comments about kind of the idea of user research before I wrap up and then we take any random questions you might have? All right. Um, so in summary, um, you want to you need to define uh, what you want, uh, you, what you want your website to do and what your audiences uh, want from you in order to be able to balance those things and to be able to provide anybody reasonably, to be able to serve anyone reasonably. If you try to be all things to all people, it's just not going to work. Um, you want to think through uh, not just the navigation, which is what people, I think, often um, default to when they're thinking about usability, but to think about content and forms. Um, and uh, so take some look at some site. It can be really kind of instructive to look at other people's sites, to think through, can you find what you're looking for? Does it make sense? Can you easily scan the information? It's for whatever re reason much easier to um, 
uh, find issues in other people's sites uh, than your own. <laughs> and then you can say, huh, but maybe that applies to ours as well. Um, and think about user testing. User testing is more straightforward than you might expect it to be. Um, so is if you are concerned about the usability of your site, it is often a, a pretty good place to start. Um, uh, and Brian has mentioned um, that um, within they have a survey bank as part of the LSN tap site, um, and we'll, they'll look to. Uh, all right, and just as you're thinking through this realm, uh, there's a lot of um, really good resources um, uh, in this area. Here's a couple that are um, uh, kind of top of mind. Um, uh, Don't Make Me Think is a book uh, by a guy named Steve Krug. Um, it is uh, a really great uh, introduction to the concepts of both usability and user testing, um, and is a, a kind of a short, easy read, nice reference book. Um, user interface engineering, um, so UIE.com, um, is uh, one of the most highly respected usability firms in the country. Um, and they have a lot of really good uh, blog posts and information about some more advanced usability type things. Um, so if you uh, have read Don't Make, Make Me Think, then user interface engineering is kind of a nice next step. Um, there's also the, uh, many people are familiar with uh, Jacob Nielsen and his uh, uh, alert, alert boxes, alert something. Um, so um, uh, he, he is now with an organization called the Nielsen Norman Group, um, and, but those um, alerts are still available, and there's a huge archive of past ones. So he tends to take on um, kind of commonly asked straightforward usability questions and apply actual research to them. So we'll uh, have an alert box on something like uh, what font is most readable or you know, what, uh, what are people looking at first in navigation. So he'll do like eye tracking studies to see uh, where people actually look first. So things like that. Um, I think he does them weekly. Um, so it can be a nice resource to just get usability stuff sent to your inbox. Fantastic. All right, and that brings us to the end of our regu regularly scheduled content. Um, but would love any uh, thoughts, questions, comments, um, experiences that you've had yourself in this realm. Anybody willing to, um, to share a few kind of takeaways before we wrap up into the chat or uh, click on the phone button to unmute, star six to unmute? I'm going to call on a couple of people that I uh, know are able to talk. Um, Michelle. Um, uh, any just kind of thoughts for us as to any takeaways that you've had um, as you um, uh, listen to this information? Um, well, I, you know, I think it's really great. I, it, it just kind of is a refresher for me in, in thinking about building a new site that I'm about to endeavor on that's the really kind of a complicated legal triage site. and. Um, you know, just considering all of the the way that the nav is going and, and all of that, I think you know that was this is kind of a refresher uh, webinar for me. Right, terrific, great, um, terrific. So I think we are at an end. Um, Liz, any closing thoughts um, before we wind? Ah, oh, she has a very important closing thought into the chat. Uh, make sure to join us on June twelfth at the same time. Um, uh, I will be back with you again, and we will be talking about accessibility. Um, ten second warning for questions. If you are typing, if you could just type something like typing into the chat so I know that you are in fact uh, still have a question. Otherwise, we will wrap up in five seconds. Um, I posted my email address there. If anybody has questions about integrating um, usability into your clinics, go ahead and just shoot me an email. I'm ha happy to help you with it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, and we will be, um, so Beth is asking whether we'll be sending any emails about the seminar on 612. Um, so it will, it's posted on the website, so the information is there. Uh, it also will be posted to LS Tech. Um, uh, so those are some ways to, um, to follow the kind of the continuing series. So there is an, uh, uh, L, uh, sorry, uh, LSNTAP is in fact running 
uh, about 10 to 12 webinars this year on technology topics uh, for legal aid organizations. Uh, fantastic. Great. Um, thank you all so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed the seminar. Um, certainly feel free. Um, so actually, here's my email address. Um, if you have uh, thoughts about the seminar, uh, feel free to send them my way. Um, and we will hope to see you on June 12th. Thanks so much.